There is a hotness tag, right? So there's, there's the hotness tag. Purely uh, erudite discussions of <laughs> pedagogy. That's true. You can get a certain chili pepper rating. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, should advisors be held accountable for lousy mentorship? Stay with us. Also, yes, they should. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 38. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey, Dan. Hey, Josh. We got a cool beer for a spring day. Much better than a hot beer on a winter day, I guess. This is the New Belgium Citradelic Tangerine IPA. Oh, we've been uh, giving some love to the New Belgium lately, haven't we? Yeah, I saw this one. It looked cool. The picture... Um, have you? Do you ever listen to Freakonomics, the podcast, or read the book? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. You know how they have the apple, and you cut yeah. in half, and it's an orange but inside. It's an orange apple. Well, this one on the label, there's a hop with a tangerine inside. That is disturbing. So I had to have it. So that's what we're drinking tonight, Dan. What do you think? Nice. Uh, it's an IPA. You haven't heard me complain yet. Yeah, this is a very drinkable one. I think. Aren't they all though? <laughs> I don't know if that distinguishes them. <laughs> it's not poison. It's not poison. I think this is a good one for sitting on the back deck, sharing a beer with friends. Yeah, more of a summertime drink. Yeah, I definitely. Like definitely. Well, Dan, I came across an article a few weeks ago that really piqued my interest. It made me think about a lot of different things. I'd love to get your opinion on it. I thought our listeners might enjoy enjoy hearing it. Well, I did hear the intro, so I have a clue about <laughs> what we're about to talk about. Yeah, so this is an article that was written by an anonymous academic uh, in December. Was it you, Josh? Who knows? Hard to say, right? Hard to say, yeah. (laughs) Admit to nothing. But this was in The Guardian, and the title is, Bad PhD Supervisors Can Ruin Research, So Why Aren't They Accountable? That is a fantastic question. We have talked many times on the show about how a, a bad research relationship can make you leave science, which is a terrible reason to have to leave science. So I thought we could just dig into this article, and I think there's some interesting themes and interesting discussion that comes out of this. So I guess, Dan, that's really the crux of this whole thing is we all know people who went into grad school gung-ho about science, gung-ho about research as a career, but then due to a bad mentoring relationship, really got burned out and ended up saying, you know what, the heck with this. I'm going to go do something else. Yeah, and normally you would hope that if there was this kind of bad apple with an orange inside in your institution, you would want somebody to notice it and something to be done about it so that they didn't burn out student after student after student. I mean, you're talking about potentially hundreds of different people that are now cast out of science because they got into the you know randomly wrong lab. Yeah, and you know, in a lot of cases, it can just be a bad personal fit right? like That's true, yeah. It's, it, sometimes it's it takes two. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But then other times, possibly could be research advisors out there who have maybe a not so great track record of student training, but there's really no mechanism in place, A, to formally identify that or even keep up with it. Um, and B, not that I know of, is there any formal way to do anything about it? So is that just inherently the problem with this relationship that it's you know, as a student, you come in and you are expecting to be mentored. Um, there's this imbalance of power and you are, you don't know what to expect. And, and so however you are treated, you assume this must be normal. I guess sometimes PIs yell at students. That's just a thing that happens. Well, you know, Dan, I think that is one of many reasons why it's very important for students before going into a PhD training program to have had multiple research experiences prior to that, because having multiple research experiences, you know, one, I guess one effect of that is that you've also had multiple mentoring experiences and you start to get a feel for not just what your personal style is, but also, I guess, what is okay and what is not. If you've experienced good mentoring, then you're going to be much quicker at identifying bad mentoring if you come into contact with it. Yeah, I'm recalling the interview we did with Natasha Snyder um, several months ago, the the faculty member, and one of the things she really highlighted was she had 
known really great mentors. And so every time she made a move to a different lab, that was front and center in her mind. And she said, you know, I went to this lab where the person said, I don't yell as much as I used to. And she said, I'm out of there. So she had that experience prior and knew this is not right. It's not okay. I don't need to put up with it. Yeah. And that is so key because, you know, Dan, I think as is obvious to us and probably to our listeners with graduate training, with PhD training, especially that relationship between the trainee and the research mentor is so critical and that really can make or break not just not just the experience you have in graduate school or in your postdoc, but really in your career. It can set your career on a trajectory, either good or bad. So one thing you mentioned, Dan, that I think is worth, worth saying again, is we have to acknowledge that there is an imbalance of power in that relationship. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I think all supervisory relationships have this balance of power. But I think it's important that mentors, that supervisors can acknowledge that this actually exists. And it's important to look for a supervisor who's going to, I guess, leverage that imbalance, leverage leverage their position to really empower and support their students. Yeah, I have a, a personal view on leadership. And to me, it is somebody who is removing the barriers in the way of their team and they're they're recognizing um, where they can help their team develop. And I think that's what mentorship is. It's not this, I'm in charge of you, so now I will hit you with a stick. It's how can I help you grow to be the best, whatever you want to be? How do we get you there? Yeah, I love that. And that really goes along with something I heard. I don't actually even remember where I heard this, but it was the difference between a boss and a mentor. And the idea was if you have a, a supervisor who who really has the mindset, what can my employees do for me in my career? That's just a boss. Yeah, and we've all known those people. Absolutely. But what you're looking for is a supervisor who really leads from the vantage point of how he or she can advocate, empower, advance your career, and really leads from a point of view of what can I do for the people under me, their career. That's what you're looking for. That's a mentor. That's right. I was at a meeting recently, and I was having a conversation with a colleague And he was very particular about not using the term mentor when what he really meant was research advisor. And so... Oh, just because that label is too good for how that relationship works. Yeah, yeah. And so we had a conversation about it after, and this really stuck with me. And his point of view was research advisor is always an accurate term because it describes that functional relationship between a trainee and their PhD advisor. But the term mentor... That is a term, that is a role that has to be earned through a certain type of action that the advisor displays or doesn't display for their trainee. Yeah, and mentorship may be in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, absolutely. Josh, you know that that it doesn't have to be such a directly aggressive uh, research advisor that is a problem. I think a lot of times if the person is really concerned about their own career, maybe they're just not in the lab at all. And so you're getting no input, no feedback. You write an email, it goes into the void, and you never hear back. And and you're again, you're not developing the way you should be because they're just not there. Yeah, and I think I think that gets at sort of this topic of professionalism that you want from a mentor. And this article really gets at the importance of your supervisor actually being responsible. So the author notes, unanswered emails only increase the anxiety of a student waiting for feedback on a discussion chapter. Unannounced departures for conferences, holidays, and research projects are frustrating, particularly when they could have been discussed in advance. And so I think what this gets at is sometimes you can run into a situation where you have an advisor who's really not acting in a very professional way and is not treating that relationship as if it is a professional relationship when it really should be. I always tell students when they're choosing a lab to pay attention to how quickly the PI gets back to them. Oh, uh, even as their emails. Oh, yeah, because that's going to be really important to you later on, like when you need the PI for feedback on your research project or to get your dissertation turned around. Or this your, sounds like a scientific approach. You're observing the, yeah. the research advisors in the wild, taking some notes. Okay, I made contact on Tuesday and didn't hear back <laughs> until the following month. That's probably a good red flag. Yeah, I mean, it may not be a huge deal when you're just, before you've committed, right? But if you really think about what is this lack of response going to be like when the chips are down and I'm trying to get my paper out, I'm trying to defend. The other side of that is probably also a problem where you email them and they're immediately like on top of the email, (laughs) reply to you. You email them at 3 a.m. and they respond at 3 or 5 a.m. It's 3 a.m. and you get a text on your phone, you up? Like, no, (laughs) no. 
<laughs> danger, danger. You want a responsive PI between the hours of eight thirty a.m. and five thirty p.m. Yeah, if they're texting you at midnight, run away. Yes. So I had a a friend in graduate school who part of her dissertation was going to be this chapter where she wrote a review and got it published. Um, and she wrote the paper and then it was supposed to go to her PI um, who was going to add some notes or something. I think it took three years of her reminding him constantly uh, for them actually to get that paper published. So that is a problem. Oh, you mean the of the student reminding the PI about The student it? did all the work. The student wrote the paper and the PI just had to edit it. And I think it took something like two or three years. Wow. How did that turn out for the student? Um, fine. I mean, she, she managed to get done and get out. But it, it was I remember her being so frustrated that she had done all this work. It was right there. And he just wouldn't take the time to do it. Wow. Yeah. So it happens. And I'm sure some of our listeners have even better stories uh, than that. So please do send them to us. Yeah. So I think you know, what's worth talking about is how this lack of mentorship or even poor mentorship, how that really impacts students or postdocs who are, are there really at this stepping stone in their career trying to get from point A to point B, because I think it can really be a roadblock. Yeah. And, and what are they doing about it? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one thing the article mentioned is when a trainee, when a grad student or postdoc really finds themselves in a lab where they're not getting effective mentorship. They say the tensions and discomfort are more keenly felt by students. We can't simply turn away from an errant supervisor and go to another, but we also can't talk freely about how we feel. This is akin to bad-mouthing your boss. Yeah, I've been known to try that once or twice. <laughs> well, and, you know, I think I think that does go to, to what do you do about it. And Yeah, know, it's, it's all whispered in the hallway. I mean, I think... I think among current students and maybe even um, students in the same lab, I think there is a sense, there is a camaraderie or a knowledge about what's going on. But the moment a new student lands, you you zip up and you don't tell them all of the details of of how their future is about to play out. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it's too late for you if you're the student who's already in the lab. Yes, you can complain about it in the hallway or even warn the rotation student, which you may or may not do. But still think about you as an individual who came into graduate school wanting to go do something, right? And needs that advisor really to advance your career. What do you do? Yeah, changing advisors is a drastic step, I think. Yeah, I mean, and I'm thinking too, you know, at least with the grad students, you can, in most types of programs these days, you can do your lab rotation. So maybe you can sniff out some of these situations a little more because you at least have a three-month trial period. I think it's even harder for postdocs, I would imagine, to to really figure this out and not get caught up in a bad mentorship situation. You've got to figure that out at the poster session, at the meeting, before you sign the paperwork. Yeah, no, absolutely. So besides whispering in the hallway, the article mentions... Skywriting? <laughs> I wanted these people to pull the banners yeah. that goes over the football game at your university. I'm renting out dirigibles anyway, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. Just call me. So, so the article mentions a couple of suggestions, and one is that universities implement some kind of performance evaluations for the research advisors. As far as I know, Dan, quality of mentorship or effectiveness of mentorship is in no way directly tied to tenure acquisition. I know there are grants and papers published, and I guess you could argue indirectly someone who's just a terrible mentor is going to have unhappy lab workers and likely won't be as efficient. But I think we also know that that's not necessarily the case. There are labs that really put out they're very productive, but the people in the lab aren't very happy. Yeah, I mean, we should we should highlight the fact that uh, I mentioned to my wife we were going to be talking about holding uh, PIs accountable, and she said they are accountable. They're accountable for publishing and for getting grants, and 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 that is true. There is there is pressure on a PI to do those things, but like you said, not necessarily to train students in a wholesome, healthy way. Yeah, and and I think it goes back to what we talked about, you know, at the top of the show, and that is, you're correct. The research advisor themselves, for their own career, they need the papers, they need the grants. But an effective mentor is not only thinking about those things, but is also thinking about what's in the best interest of my trainees. How can I understand who they are and where they want to go as an individual 
and help them get there while at the same time they're helping me. And I would argue that mentors who are effective at that probably have more productive and, and happy employees. It seems like that should be measurable in some way in, in the sense that you can have an assessment of mentorship effectiveness and then read all, read out all of the outcomes like how many papers you've published and your grant funding, things like that. Maybe that's some research you should work on, Josh. That sounds interesting to me. It does. Is there no is there no rate my professor for PIs? Well, so if, for those of you who aren't familiar, although I assume most everyone's familiar with RateMyProfessor.com, I actually went on there today because I wanted to know if it was still a thing. Uh, but it is, but it seems to be, Rate My Professor is a site where it seems like mostly undergraduates can rate how effective their professors are at teaching courses. And, yeah, that's right. And actually, you know, I was impressed by the quality and thoughtfulness for a lot of the reviews that I read by students because I have expected it to just be there some is a, disgruntled. There is people. a hotness tag, right? So there, there's it's the hotness not tag. Purely uh, erudite discussions of. <laughs> pedagogy that's true you can get a certain chili pepper rating yeah that's right uh, but yeah you know i think it would be fascinating to have a a rate my pi site right that rates faculty on their i don't really like what's it like to be in their lab under their direction now i think the challenge would be you know rating an undergraduate instructor of bio 100 that can be very anonymous right because you might teach 100 to 300 students a semester versus, <laughs> Dan, yeah. if you rated your yeah. research mentor. It was just me, yeah. It could have been anybody. It could have been any one of two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Both of us feel this way. Yeah, I, I think that is a problem. And and it occurred to me to look at rate my professor to maybe say professors who are good teachers are also good PIs, but I think those two are not necessarily correlated. Yeah, and you know, so few, at least you know, at least in my world, like in the kind of medical university research one institution, the PIs are doing so little teaching and they're really doing no undergraduate teaching. The The teaching part is so little. Um, You're not going to actually job. get ratings. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, some other things that the, the article mentioned we could do is besides these performance evaluations, the very least having safe spaces for PhD students to actually share the issues they're having, whether uh, maybe in private or sort of have an advocate that they could go to to help them navigate some of these situations. And, you know, along those lines is maybe having staff who can provide constructive advice, how to have difficult conversations, how to do what's called leading up. Have you heard of that concept? Yeah, it, it sounds familiar to me. This is where you have a manager and you try to manage them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think universities that have people like Dara that we spoke with a few weeks weeks back some resources so you at least don't feel like you're alone when you're dealing with these challenging mentor um, situations but you think there's no way that this factor gets into tenure discussions i mean i think it would be great to do that but that would certainly be a decision that would have to be made at the i guess the upper administration level of universities although i happen to know i'm sure we have tons of of high level deans and provosts who listen to hello phd so if they're out there I'm pretty sure it's a job requirement. <laughs> well, if you have feedback or input on this, uh, or if you have ideas for how to uh, more coherently assess the mentorship skills of a, of a research advisor, do write to us. The email address is podcast at hellophd.com. I think the last note I want to end on is if you're out there and you find yourself in a lab situation where you feel like the mentorship is really lacking between you and your advisor. Maybe it's maybe it's a toxic situation. You're feeling like the feedback's not constructive, but actually is destructive. Or if it's non-existent, like we talked about, you just feel like you're all alone and not getting any advice. Um, or if maybe it's just not the right mentorship for you. Maybe there are other students in the lab that are doing fine, but based on sort of your needs and expectations, it's not a good fit for you. Remember, you can always change advisors, right? If this is what you want to do, if science is where you want to be and the career you want to pursue, but the environment you're in now is not helping you get there, don't forget, you can always change your mind. There are plenty of people out there who have changed and found kind of new life in graduate school um, after switching gears and finding a new environment. Yeah, you don't have to leave the field because of one bad advisor. And it might slow you and down. And you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Right? You shouldn't. And you Stick know, it to them. Stay with science and yeah. show them. And it might cost you six months or a year, but in the long run, it could be way better off. Are you ready for an etymology puzzle? I'm always ready for an etymology puzzle. Oh, good. 
Last week's clue was these nocturnal primates are the ghosts of Madagascar. Ooh. Good ghost noises. Yeah, I have kids now. They like the movie Madagascar. Okay, well, you may get this answer if you can name some of the Madagascar creatures. Lemur. That is correct. Really? Yeah, it really is. Really? Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that, I haven't seen the movie, is it? Is no, I just creatures? named an animal. Okay, I don't know. Well, there you go. Is you that got, really right? That is absolutely <laughs> correct. So Send me my gift card. Uh, it's on its way across the room to you. I can't believe I did that right. I really didn't look at that. Lemur comes from... <laughs> I just named like the first animal that came yeah, No, that's right. That's awesome. Lemur comes from Roman mythology. Um, so in ancient Rome, in Latin, lemuries were ghosts. They were these wandering, vengeful spirits who uh, came from people who didn't have proper burials and they didn't have the right funeral rites. And so these ghosts would wander around. Um, when somebody got to Madagascar, they saw an, a different animal called the Slender Loris. And it's nocturnal, has a very slow pace. And so they named it after these uh, ghosts, basically. And later it came to be applied to all the primates, or many of the primates in Madagascar. And so lemurs are ghosts. Didn't see that one coming. Oh, wait, you did. <laughs> Actually, that's crazy. Huh. Okay, well, if you are ready for next week's puzzle... They're really cute. They are pretty adorable. Uh, Slender Loris is not quite as cute. The Slender Loris has, like, the big red eyes. Uh Oh. What do you have for this week? This week, we got a special surprise clue from Megan Bond, our friend who writes uh, etymology puzzles with me. We should really put Megan on the payroll. Oh, we really should, because this one's a really good one. I was so happy when I figured it out, and it did take me a while, but I'll read it now. This equine sea monster helps you to remember Greek mythology and find your way to lab. Read it again. This equine sea monster helps you remember Greek mythology and find your way to lab. So, I'm looking for a scientific word described by the clue, and once you get it, you'll find the literal meaning of that science word is a phrase in the clue itself. If you think you know the answer, email it to puzzle at hellophd.com, and I'll randomly select a winner from all the correct responses, and send the lucky puzzler an Amazon gift card. And people do get them. It's very exciting. Everybody's so pleased by a small Amazon gift card that I send them. Dan, as always, this was a great conversation. I thought this was an interesting topic. Yeah, it's a a really important one. Um, I'm not sure that we have all the answers just yet, but I think talking about it starts the conversation. That's right. And uh, if you'd like to talk about it further or you have thoughts, we would love to hear them. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com. You can send us a tweet at hellophd, or you can always send us a message on the Facebook page. I hope people do that. I hope they do too. I love to read them. I keep looking across at your bottle of beer and keep thinking it says Citrusel, which I believe is a fiber supplement. But it says, what does it say? Citradelic? Also not to be confused with Duracell. Nope, it's not that either. This is good. I like this. This makes me ready for summertime. All right. Well, we are ready. We will see you next week. See you next week.